Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Fight Colorectal Cancer podcast. Uh, my name is Sharon Worrell, and I'll be helping to, to moderate this uh, webinar today. Um, we're super excited for the topic area, tumor versus germline testing. So today's webinar, uh, we're excited to have Scott Weissman um, present today. If you have a question come up, feel free to type it into the control panel on the right side of your screen. And if you'd like to access the webinar after the, after the live presentation, visit fightcrc.org backslash webinar and you can find it there. And finally, feel free to tweet along with Fight Colorectal Cancer on Twitter using the hashtag CRCWebinar. So Fight CRC does offer a number of different patient education resources, including our Tabooty podcast, where we talk about taboo topics. We have our specialty mini magazines that really do a deep dive into specific topic areas, such as clinical trials, biosimilars, genetics, and more. And then finally, we have our resource, Your Guide in the Fight, um, which is a three-part book uh, geared towards um, patients from the time of diagnosis through survivorship. As a reminder, the information and services provided by Fight CRC are for general informational purposes only. The information and services are not intended to be substitutes for professional medical advice, diagnoses, or treatment. If you are ill or suspect you might be ill, see a doctor immediately and in an emergency, call 911 or go to the nearest emergency room. Fight CRC never recommends or endorses any specific physicians, products, or treatments for any condition. And finally, Scott Weissman, um, he's the founder of the Chicago Genetics, Genetic Consultants, uh, which is a private genetic counseling practice. Um, he's been doing this work for, for quite a while and is an expert in the field. And he's also currently a clinical faculty member at the Northwestern University Graduate Program in Genetic Counseling. So we're really excited for the presentation and for Scott to share his expertise. And Scott, from here, I will um, hand the controls to you and, and thanks for joining. Let's see. There we go. Is my screen coming through? Yes. All right, wonderful. Um, well, uh, thank you everybody for the invitation to come and speak to you and thank you Sharon and Fight CRC specifically. So um, today what we're gonna do is talk about the differences between tumor versus germline genetic testing and really what's the difference is this is an area that's really becoming more and more commonplace for individuals who are diagnosed with colorectal cancer or who have a family history of it. Um, so just a quick disclosure, I am a genetic counselor. I am not a medical oncologist. Um, nothing in the talk that I'll be giving today is promoting specific tests, companies, or any treatment recommendations. Um, a lot of what I'm gonna be telling you are just kind of, it's general information, and some of these things are recommended, but there's a lot of nuances in terms of when these certain tests should be done and when the certain treatments should be tagged along with the different tests. So again, this is really kind of a general overview, but not really anything that is specifically geared towards treating um, you know, your specific um, situation. And just some conflict of interest, I don't think any of my conflicts actually will impact the talk today, so I'm gonna skip through this. Uh, okay, so the points of discussion. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of, sort of a genetics primer to set the stage for the rest of the discussion. Um, we'll then spend um, time talking about tumor genetic testing followed by germline genetic testing. And I'm hopefully gonna go through this quick enough to give you guys what you need, but also leave some time for questions as well. All right, so we're gonna get really basic here. Like I said, I don't know what level people are coming in at, so we're just gonna start off by saying that basically, you know, you are made up of cells. Your skin, your organs, everything made up is made up of cells. And inside the center of the cells, which is the nucleus, are chromosomes. And chromosomes are um, the, basically is where your DNA and genes are housed. And you get one chromosome from your mom and one chromosome from your dad for the 23 pairs of chromosomes that we have. And like I said, the chromosomes are made up of the DNA. And the DNA is the basic building block for, for genes. 
And so genes are basically, and genes in your DNA are made up of four chemicals, which are called base pairs. And specifically what they're called, you may you know, recall those from high school or college biology, but basically what I want you to remember are the A's, G's, C's, and T's. So those are the four building blocks of your DNA. And typically A's will kind of pair up with T's and G's typically pair up with C's. So T partners with A's and G's partner with C's. So that'll become a little bit relevant later on. And the genes carry the chemical instructions to make all of the proteins that your body needs. So, you know, your height, your hair color, your eye color, how your body metabolizes food and drugs are all basically done by different proteins in your body. And so the gene really has the instruction or the code for one or more proteins in your body. Um, and like I said, you typically have two copies of most genes, one that you get from your mom and one that you get from your dad. So with genes, you can actually do genetic tests where you can um, extract DNA out of blood or tissue or an actual cancer or saliva, and you can read the genetic code of these genes to basically get a sense of, is the genetic code of the gene working correctly, or are there any potential problems? And the way that this is typically done is when you send off a tumor or a blood sample to a laboratory, is that they extract your DNA out of the blood, and then they shred it into these small fragments, and then they, they know where the genes are and in which chromosomes they're housed, and so the laboratory is able to target specific areas of the genes and amplify the DNA over and over and over again with different added chemicals to be able to generate enough DNA to read the genetic code. The way I typically describe this to people is a genetic test is like a spell check, right? So if you think about a gene like a sentence, a genetic test is going through and making sure that every single word is spelled correctly and that each word is, is in the right place so that when you are reading the sentence, you understand what it's trying to tell you. So what a genetic test is typically looking for is to see if there are any pathogenic variants or mutations. So any changes to the genetic code that would cause the gene not to work correctly. Okay, so that's kind of the ultimate goal of a genetic test. And there's two main techniques that can be used to do this. Um, an older technique that is still employed with some of the tumor testing is called polymerase chain reaction or PCR. If you ever saw Jurassic Park, they talk about PCR kind of when they're talking about how they clone the dinosaurs. Um, or there is a newer type of genetic testing that is called next generation sequencing, which they are using for both doing tumor genetic testing as well as when they're doing testing for hereditary cancer syndromes or germline genetic testing. So busy picture here, but let me walk you through it. So in the top panel, part A, you can see at the very top of the screen, all the A's, T's, G's, and C's there. And that is the genetic code for a specific gene that is called CDH1. You can potentially see that right there. And so this picture is an example of a next generation sequencing where um, you have multiple different fragments, and that's these gray bars here, of the CDH1 gene that have been shredded and amplified and basically aligned to be able to read the genetic code of this gene. And you can see over here in the top left, there is this red T. And so this is what the normal genetic code looks like at this part of this CDH gene. If you can actually take a look here, you can maybe potentially see that there are these G's at various parts in the genetic code here. And that would be considered a variation of the genetic code that could potentially cause an abnormality. So this is a next generation way of looking at it. And here's the same way of looking for that change using more of a, a PCR-based assay here, where you can see that the red, the, the T's are these red peaks, and you can see where the, there is a G, you can see that some of the genetic code has the T there, and some of the genetic code has the G there. And the reason that you're seeing kind of the two letters, or the G's and the T's, is that one gene from mom is okay, but the gene from dad is not. And so that's why you're still seeing the two letters um, in the genetic code. And so again, this is how laboratory is able to look at a genetic test data to figure out what's normal and what is not. Okay, 
So with that background, um, let's start talking about the difference between tumor testing and germline testing. And we're gonna start with tumor testing. So what's an important concept to realize is that all cancers, whether you're talking about colorectal or lung or breast, all cancers arise from genetic mutations. For a normal cell in the body to become a cancer cell, it has to go through a series of genetic errors that allow it to go from normal to cancer. And so with that, all cancers have what are called somatic mutations. And these are mutations that occur in the tissue of origin, so in this case, in the colon, that are specific in the colon cells that cause the colon cancer to arise. These somatic mutations are not heritable, okay? You can't pass them along to your family members. They develop by chance. And so they are in every cancer, but they are by far the most common uh, mutations in sporadic cancers, when the cancers just happen to occur by chance. And about 90 to 95% of people who get diagnosed with cancer will fall into this sporadic cancer category. So generally speaking, if you kind of take that idea that all cancer is genetic, how do colorectal cancers arise? And um, this is a, a, a broad example of something that's called the Vogelgram. And the Vogelgram is the um, explanation of how a colon cancer arises genetically. Because there are a series of genetic errors where genes are either um, turned on that should be quiet, and those are the, represented by these green pictures here, these green boxes, and a combination of genes that should be working that get turned off, or these red boxes. So typically what happens is that in the colon, you have kind of the normal colon wall, and if you have some mutations that occur in these genes, you can get the development of a small um, polyp. And if that polyp remains in the colon, additional genetic errors can occur over time, which can allow that small polyp to become a large polyp. And again, if it sits in the colon, additional genetic errors can potentially occur, which can cause that polyp to actually become a cancerous tumor. And if that cancer sits in the colon long enough without getting removed, then some other genetic changes that can occur that lead the cancer to start to kind of break through the colon wall and start to metastasize to other parts of the body. So it's really kind of a series of genetic changes over the course of a long period that allow the normal colon to become a cancer. And so it really, there, it's why there's such a push in the medical community to do colorectal cancer screening, it's because if you can find a colon growth in this you know, precancerous polyp stage and you remove it, you can essentially prevent a colon cancer from occurring the vast majority of the time, but not always. Why do we even really consider testing the colon cancers and looking for somatic tumors in the colon? And there's really kind of two pieces of critical information that you can get out of doing a somatic tumor test. One is what we consider prognostic information. And so this can tell your healthcare provider about the aggressiveness of the tumor. And it can also give your healthcare provider additional information about whether that particular colon cancer is at a higher or lower risk for developing um, metastatic disease. And the reason that that's relevant is it can influence the treatment decisions that a physician may make when determining whether or not somebody needs treatment for their colon cancer. And so again, it can really help providers make um, decisions on whether to give chemotherapy or sometimes some other decisions depending upon the, the somatic mutations in the colorectal tumor, it can help give uh, guidance to whether or not somebody should be treated with chemotherapy versus immunotherapy. And sometimes it gets an even a little bit more granular than that, where it can even determine the type of chemotherapy or the type of immunotherapy that should be given. And then where there's kind of a, a new area of somatic testing that's been developing over the past few years, is in people that have advanced um, or what's called refractory disease, so disease that really hasn't responded to treatment, they're, by doing somatic testing, it really potentially opens up the, op the opportunity to look for new treatment options that you typically wouldn't have thought about otherwise. And as a byproduct of the somatic testing, sometimes the somatic tests can actually identify people who've developed colorectal cancer due to a hereditary cause, so something that is in their genetic makeup that predisposed them to developing that cancer. So with somatic testing in colorectal cancer, I'm gonna talk about really kind of two kinds of tests. 
Uh, the first are tests that are really recommended. And there's two organizations that have put out statements about what somatic testing should be recommended. So the first is the American Society of, uh, for Clinical Oncology, or ASCO. And this is the medical society that most medical oncologists belong to. And then is, there is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. And this is an organization of um, academic and large university healthcare systems that really have expertise in treating cancer. And then we'll talk about some of the, some tests that are out there that are more optional that some doctors recommend and others do not. So let's start with the recommended tests. So the first set of tests I wanna talk about um, involve a gene system in your body that is called the mismatch repair system or the MMR system. So the mismatch repair genes are genes that are involved in correcting single base pair mistakes that can occur during replication. So as you, you know, live your life, there are certain cells in your body that are, have, are constantly multiplying and dividing and, and developing uh, new cells. And so if you think about the possibility that these cells are doing this on a regular basis, there's always the possibility that errors can occur when the DNA is replicating itself, making a new cell. So this mismatch repair system is there to help identify when those errors occur and fix them and put them back to normal. So in the picture here on the right, you can see there's a series of um, C's and A's that are repeated over and over again, and it's repeated eight times. And during the replication process, there's been a ninth CA that's been inserted into this sequence here. So when the mismatch repair system is working normally, it identifies that this has been repeated, it goes in, it basically cuts it out so that in the cell, you have the eight repeats, which is what is normally expected to be seen. However, if somebody happens to have a mutation or um, a pathogenic variant in one of the mismatch repair genes that's causing it not to work correctly, what can happen is that you can get that inserted and it does not get repaired. It does not get removed out. And now you have nine repeats instead of eight, and that could potentially lead to problems down the road, okay? So that's what this mismatch repair system does. And so if somebody's mismatch repair system is not working in their, in their cancer, it's referred to as mismatch repair deficiency or DMMMR. And the common genes that are typically looked at for mismatch repair deficiency are called MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2. So there are two different ways that your colorectal tumors can be tested to look for evidence of defic deficient mismatch repair. One is through a test that is called immunohistochemistry, or IHC for short. So this is a, um, a tool where the um, uh, pathology department that has your colorectal cancer tumor, it basically does a painting or a chemical staining of the tumor cells and the normal cells to look for specific proteins of interest. So again, I talked about how genes produce proteins, but we actually have chemicals that we can identify those proteins in the cells. So, if somebody has a mismatch repair deficiency, typically what will happen, there will be, you will be missing the protein. So if a gene doesn't work, it doesn't produce the protein correctly. So if you have a colorectal cancer tumor, you can look to see are the proteins present or absent. If all of the proteins are present, that would mean that the, that the mismatch repair system is working correctly. But if there's a deficiency, you will be missing one or more proteins. So in the picture here on the left, brown, when you see brown, that means that the protein is present inside the cells. And when you see blue, that means the protein's missing. So you can see here that in this, this particular tumor, you can see that both the MLH1 and the PMS2 proteins are both missing, where you can clearly see with the MSH2 and the MSH6 proteins, there's a lot of brown there and that is present. So this would be an example where in this particular tumor, there would be deficient mismatch repair deficiency. The other way that you can identify deficient mismatch repair deficiency is through a test that is called microsatellite instability analysis, sometimes referred to as MSI for short. So microsatellites are these short segments of DNA that are 
located throughout your genome that are these repeated sequences um, such as CA, CA, CA. It doesn't really do anything. It's, it, it occurs in non-relevant regions of your genome. And these microsatellites can be um, various sizes, so it could potentially be four base pairs that are repeated over again, or five. And then the repeat sizes themselves can be different sizes. So you could have something that's repeated 10 times or something that's repeated 20 times. And this information is typically inherited from your parents. So even though it's in regions of your DNA that don't do anything, it's information that's still passed down from you. So there are genetic tests available that can measure the sizes of these microsatellite repeated regions. So microsatellite instability is when in the tumor, there is either an expansion or a contraction of these microsatellites. And again, this is a downstream effect of loss of function of the mismatch repair system. So let me see if I can explain this better with a picture. So um, on the left here, again, we have this IHC stain, and the T is for tumor, and the N is for the normal colon tissue. So the picture's not great, but you can really see here that there is brown um, staining for all four proteins. So this would be evidence of a, of a, a mismatch repair system working correctly. And you can see here that when you look at the microsatellites, these different sizes, you can see that between the normal and the tumor, that the sizes are exactly the same. So again, this tumor would be considered to be microsatellite stable because the microsatellites haven't changed in size. So again, you have evidence of um, proficient or a working mismatch repair system. Now in this picture, again, what you can see here is that the tumor is again missing the MLH1 and MSH2 proteins. There's no brown there, only blue. And again, with MSH2 and MSH6, you can see all the brown. And if you come over and look at the microsatellites, if you start looking at the differences between the normal and the tumor, you can see that in the tumor, there's all these other sizes that are there that are not matching up to the normal. So there has been either an expansion or contraction of these microsatellites. This tumor is considered to be unstable. And when that occurs, we say that the tumor is microsatellite instability high. So again, this would be evidence that the mismatch repair system isn't working correctly. So why does this matter? Why is this relevant? So 10 to 15% of colon cancers will have deficient mismatch repair deficiency, or you'll find microsatellite instability. Um, it's less common in rectal cancers, and it's really most common in stage two cancers. So this is relevant because these tumors that have this deficiency are less likely to become metastatic, Patients that have tumors that have mismatch repair deficiency have more favorable outcomes, so they do better overall. And that's kind of the, the prognostic information there. Treatment information is that typically tumors that show this deficient mismatch repair deficiency, they don't respond to, well to one of the standard chemotherapies given to treat colorectal cancer, um, 5-FU or fluorouracil. Um, also, if somebody has a stage two colorectal cancer that has this um, deficient mismatch repair deficiency, they really don't benefit from treatment. So this test would tell an oncologist, you know what, this patient isn't gonna get any benefit from chemotherapy, so they don't really need it. Um, and what's been really a relatively groundbreaking um, type of treatment for cancer in general, not just specific to colorectal cancer, is a drug that's called Keytruda or Pembrolizumab. Pembrolizumab, I'm never very good at saying these names, um, but this is a type of immunotherapy. And this drug, this was the first time a drug was ever approved by the FDA where it can be given to any cancer that has this deficient mismatch repair deficiency. So kind of for the history up until this point in time, all drugs were approved for a specific cancer, whereas this drug was approved for a specific genetic makeup of cancers. Um, so again, not specific to colorectal cancer, but I thought it was important to share with you guys here. The other relevant information for the deficient mismatch repair deficiency is that it could tell somebody whether or not there may be a hereditary cause to their colorectal cancer. So about 90 to 95% of individuals with Lynch syndrome, which is the most common hereditary colorectal cancer, 
will have a deficient mismatch repair system in their colorectal cancer tumors. So if a colorectal cancer is identified to have deficiency mismatch repair, it indicates that a referral should be made to a genetics professional to be evaluated for Lynch syndrome. And Lynch syndrome is caused by mutations in those same four genes that you were potentially born with, right? And so um, that is, again, an example of where a somatic mutation can dictate treatment, but also if it happens to be in your complete genetic makeup, it may indicate a hereditary risk as well. So given the prognostic, the treatment, and the hereditary implications, anyone who has colorectal cancer should have IHC for the mismatch repair done or the MSI testing to be performed at the time of diagnosis. So if this is something that you've had colorectal cancer and it was not done, it's something that you wanna go back and talk to your physicians about. This is really becoming standard of care to do this in anyone who was diagnosed with colorectal cancer regardless of age or regardless of where the tumor is in the colon. Okay, so the second recommended set of tests um, that uh, come up when treating colorectal cancer are um, uh, genes involved in what's called the epithelial growth factor receptor or EGFR pathway. So the genes involved in this pathway are very important in the cell is how the cell grows, how it survives in your body, how it proliferates. So how it, again, it's another word for growth, but a different kind of growth. And then how the cells differentiate or to make sure that the cell becomes the correct cell that it's supposed to become in the body. So in cancers, if this pathway is overactive, it's working too well, it can actually lead to the progression of cancer. So, you know, smart scientists basically figured out, well, if we know that this pathway can cause cancers to um, become worse, maybe we can find a way to shut this pathway down when it's working so that the cancer doesn't progress. And so there are two specific anti-EGFR drugs that are out there that are called monoclonal antibodies. And these are basically drugs that recruit the immune system to come and fight the cancer on, on your behalf. Um, one is called Herbitux, the other one is Vestibix. Um, and again, these are used in, in situations where um, the EGFR pathway is overactive in somebody's colorectal cancer. The genes involved with the pathway that can be tested for in colorectal cancer tumors are, are a, a, a family of genes called the RAS genes. So the first two genes, KRAS and NRAS, again, genes that are involved with cell signaling pathways and they control how the cell grows, matures, and, and ultimately how cells die because all cells have a finite life cycle. When the gene is in its normal state, so there's no mutations in the gene, the gene is working just fine, it's called wild type. Um, and what we know is that at least 40% of colorectal cancers have mutations in the KRAS gene and to a lesser extent, the NRAS gene. And there has been a recommendation that all individuals with metastatic colorectal cancer should be tested for specific mutations in these genes. And that is because um, prognostically, if these genes are mutated, it may lead to shorter disease-free intervals, meaning when you treat somebody with chemotherapy, the time between the, they get the chemotherapy and the cancer goes away, and the time when it could potentially come back. And then again, as we were just talking about, it can impact treatment. So if these genes are working, that means they're in the wild type state, it means the pathway is working, and so individuals with metastatic colorectal cancer can be treated with these anti-EGFR drugs. But if these genes are mutated in a tumor and the pathway is not working correctly, you really cannot give individuals these drugs the vast majority of the time it's because they're not just, they're not gonna work. These um, anti-EGFR monoclonal antibodies only work when the pathway is working. So again, they will do a somatic test, they will test for mutations. If there's no mutations in the tumor, the treatment is an option. But if there are mutations, then it's unlikely that this treatment's gonna be an option. The other gene um, in the EGFR pathway is a different family. It's called the RAF family. And this is a, a gene that's called BRAF. 
And again, it basically has the same function. Again, when it's in its normal state, it's called to be sets to the wild type. And there is primarily one mutation that occurs not just in colorectal cancer, but in many cancers. And this one BRAF mutation is called the V600E mutation. It's seen in about five to nine percent of colorectal cancers, and it is a poor prognostic indicator. So if someone's tumor has the BRAF B600E mutation, it means the tumor is likely to be a little bit more aggressive and that the tumor is going to be less responsive to certain therapies. So again, if somebody's metastatic colorectal cancer, if their BRAF gene is wild type, if it's normal, then they can be treated with these anti-EGFR um, uh, monoclonal antibodies. But if the, the mutation is present in the colorectal cancer tumor, and typically that treatment is not going to be recommended. And there's also with the BRAF gene, there are some hereditary implications as well. So this BRAF mutation is often seen in tumors that have mismatch repair deficiency. So when that mutation is present, when there is mismatch repair deficiency in a tumor, it is unlikely that an individual has Lynch syndrome. So if you're looking at a pathology report and you see that you know you're you have mismatch repair deficiency, but you weren't referred to see genetics, it may be because you also had this BRAF B600E mutation. So given these implications, anyone who has a stage four colorectal cancer should be tested for the BRAF V600E mutation to help with treatment choices. And then again, if a tumor shows that um, this deficient mismatch repair, then this B, BRAF V600E mutation should be considered to be tested to rule in or out the possibility of whether somebody may have Lynch syndrome. Okay, so the mismatch repair and the EGFR pathways are really the two main systems, two main pathways that both the American Society of Clinical Oncology and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network typically recommend be tested in certain situations. So the next tests that I'm gonna talk about really are tests that are more optional, that, that get offered in various situations depending upon um, what is going on um, with someone's specific colorectal cancer. Uh, so there's a couple of other genes in the EGFR pathway. Uh, one is called PIK3CA and another one called P10. And these are genes that can have, again, an important impact on the development and prognosis of colorectal cancers. Um, the PIK3CA is found in about up to maybe 20%. The P10 a little bit less commonly seen in colorectal cancers, respectively. And the data about the prognostic implications and the treatment implications are not conclusive. There's data that shows that sometimes this information can impact treatment and outcomes, and there's other data that says that it may not. So for that reason, there's no real standard of care that these two genes should be tested for on a regular basis outside of a, a clinical trial. So maybe looking at um, a new treatment for colorectal cancer. So sometimes this may be done more on a research basis. And then there's a series of what, what are called multi-gene tests that can be done on a colorectal cancer. And these are tests that are used to evaluate multiple genes at once. And um, some of the laboratories that offer these tests, really, they are proprietary in nature, meaning they don't necessarily share all of the genes that they're testing for in their, their test, uh, but they have been validated to show that their test works. There's several on the, on the market. Um, you know, your doctors may um, choose to run them depending upon the stage of a colorectal cancer. Um, many of them are using next generation sequencing and, and other newer genetic testing technologies. And these are tests that may or may not be covered by, by your insurance if your doctor were to order them. So um, here's three examples of multi-gene tests that can be offered to individuals that have stage two or stage three disease to potentially help determine whether or not treatments should be given. So they're not really tests that are gonna tell you which treatment somebody should get, but whether or not somebody's tumor looks more aggressive and is more likely to recur. Um, so there's one that's called Oncotype DX that's offered by Genomic Health. It looks at the expression of 12 genes and provides a recurrence score, so low, intermediate, or high, to help with treatment um, discussions. 
And so basically, if potentially the idea would be if somebody had a low recurrence score, that there'd be less likely that the tumor would recur and they may not really need therapy. Whereas if the recurrent score of this 12 gene panel was high, then this is somebody you may want to offer treatment to. Um, there's one that's called Coloprint by Agendia, and it looks at a combination of 18 different genes, and it really provides more of a lower high score. And what they say on their website is that it improves the identification of patients who benefit from therapy. So again, this idea that these tests are helping make decisions about whether chemotherapy should be offered. And then the last one is um, something called ColDX. And this is a rather large test where it looks at 482 genes plus another 100 genetic markers that again develops a recurrence score, either low or high risk of recurrence of the colorectal cancer. So again, same idea as the Coloprint where it's really trying to figure out who may benefit from ther therapy. Um, and just to make a quick comment that these multi-gene tests are not identifying people who may have a hereditary form of cancer. Really, it is really purely that treatment decision. Um, so again, tests that are designed to help make treatment decisions, um, you know, with low risk, you're not really going to treat typically with high risk, you typically would treat. And it, if somebody gets an intermediate risk score, the doctor's probably going to take into account other risk factors to make that treatment decision. And again, it's not going to gear a specific, not going to tell you what specific chemotherapy or immunotherapy should be used. Now, for people who have more advanced disease, perhaps stage four, perhaps metastatic disease, there are a um, new set of tests that are really looking at as much of the genetic makeup of the tumor as possible to see if there are drugs out there that could be used to treat the colorectal cancer that perhaps you typically wouldn't use in colorectal cancer, but were approved for some other cancer, breast, lung, pancreatic, something, something like that. So it's really kind of thinking outside the box for people that aren't responding to the standard therapies. One of the more common ones that's used is something that's called the Foundation One um, CDX test that's offered by Foundation Medicine. So it's looking at 324 genes. It's looking at a number of, of various um, different types of genetic mutations in genes. So um, what are called substitutions, insertions, deletions. So again, kind of changes to the genetic information. Um, it will look at genetic signatures to say whether or not the tumor has microsatellite instability. And it also looks at something that's called tumor mutational burden. And that's basically saying how many genes are really mutated in this cancer. And colorectal cancers that have high mutational burden, so there's a lot of genetic problems in that tumor, are more likely to benefit from an immunotherapy type of approach in terms of treating it. Um, there's a test that's called the Molecular Intelligence Comprehensive Tumor Profiling offered by Keras Life Sciences that's looking at a combination of DNA plus um, RNA and other proteins in tumors to help with treatment decisions. Um, the founder of Groupon created a, um, a somatic tumor company called um, Tempus, and they have their test that's called XO, which looks at um, more than 1,700 genes in the DNA and RNA to again, potentially come up with some, some outside the box treatment ideas for patients. And then even many academic institutions, uh, places like Baylor, Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, are offering their own in-house designed uh, multi-gene tests to help their own uh, physicians with treatment decisions. And some of these tests are able to actually identify patients that have a hereditary form of colorectal cancer. So these tests, you can get both somatic and germline information out of it to, again, help not only with treatment discussions, but also to identify people that may have hereditary risk, where then you can alert their family members that there could be a, a, a hereditary risk of cancer in the family. Um, let's see, as I mentioned, these genetic tests are looking for mutations or this tumor mutational burden to see if kind of novel or off-label therapies can be tried. Uh, like the EGFR pathway, there are many other pathways out there that can lead to cancer development and many drugs on the markets. And sometimes having this information can make people um, eligible for different clinical trials. So some physicians will order this type of um, 
this multi-gene, you know, sequencing or exome approach to a somatic tumor to get somebody uh, eligible for a clinical trial. So a brief summary, so somatic tumor testing, these are genetic tests done on tumor tissue to help determine prognosis of a colorectal cancer diagnosis and in some situations guide treatment decisions. Um, usually used in individuals with stage two or higher disease. And it, they're typically done using a variety of different genetic tests. There's different technologies that can be used. Uh, some of them can identify individuals with a hereditary form of cancer. And many of them, but not all of them, may be covered by insurance um, when ordered by a healthcare provider. Okay, and so let's end the talk in, uh, about um, germline mutations. So again, we talked about how all cancers arise from gene mutations. So germline mutations are mutations in your genetic cone that you are born with. This is something that was passed to you from one of your parents, either your mother or your father. And the term germline is referring to mutations that are in the eggs of women or in the sperm of men. And that's how they get passed on to the next generation. Um, so they would be present in all the cells of someone's body when they are born versus, again, we talked about somatic mutations. They are only found in the tumor, or excuse me, in the tissue that has cancer in it. Um, so with these germline mutations, they're heritable. They cause familial cancer syndromes. And about, generally speaking, about 10% of people who get cancer uh, will it will be due to a germline mutation that predisposed them to getting that particular cancer. So again, when you, when you look at people who are diagnosed with colorectal cancer, the vast majority uh, develop by chance or what we say is sporadic, about five to 10% are hereditary. And then there is this other piece of the pie that I just wanted to mention that's called familial colorectal cancer. And that's probably about maybe 20% of people who get diagnosed where they've had colorectal cancer, and there's colorectal cancer in their family, but there isn't necessarily a single gene responsible for the cancer in their family. So familial colorectal cancer risks means there's probably many genes that are combining to increase a risk of developing colorectal cancer. Nothing that we can really test for currently, unlike hereditary uh, colorectal cancer, which is due to a single gene and something that we can identify with a genetic test. So typically, when we're looking at a family history, there are various factors that make, make us think that there could be something hereditary going on. If you're seeing two or more people on the same side of the family with the same cancer, if you're seeing people diagnosed with colorectal cancer under the age of 50, anybody that's had more than one uh, colorectal cancer, or in certain cases, not specific for the colon, but uh, bilateral, so you know people that get cancer in both breasts or both kidneys or rare cancers. If you see male breast cancer, that's considered a rare cancer. Uh, also, there's certain constellations of tumors that make you think about a specific cancer syndrome. So if you're seeing colon cancer and uterine cancer traveling in the family, or you're seeing colon cancer and people developing dozens of, or hundreds of colon polyps, that can be um, suggestive of a hereditary risk. And the vast majority of these genes that can cause a hereditary colorectal cancer syndrome are passed along in what's called a dominant fashion which basically means that in this case, anybody with orange is somebody who carries the mutation. When you have children, there's basically a 50-50 chance of passing it on to each child independently of one another. And so with many of these genes, um, it, not everybody is guaranteed to get cancer. It means that your risk is going to be higher than average. So sometimes people can carry the risk but never develop it. Okay, so with, again, dominant uh, inheritance, there's a 50-50 chance of it being passed along. That's kind of the main takeaway there. In terms of the types of genes that we can test for for hereditary colorectal cancer, I kind of bin them into three different categories. So everybody has a colon, so everybody has a risk of developing colon cancer, and on average, that risk is about 5%. Um, so there are genes that are known to cause a high risk of colorectal cancer where the risk can be anywhere from maybe 30 to upwards of 100% over the course of somebody's lifetime. And with these high risk genes, you can offer people increased cancer screening or in some cases even cancer prevention. There's more moderate risk genes where the risk is maybe gonna be less than 30% over the course of somebody's lifetime where you may just offer them increased screening. And then there are some new genes that have been more recently discovered where the risk isn't really known or maybe some low risk genes where the risk is gonna be less than 
20% over the course of someone's lifetime. And with these newer or low risk genes, because they're newer or low risk, we don't really know exactly what kind of management people need. So I understand that, um, uh, that Fight CRC has put on a, uh, a, a hereditary colorectal cancer lecture previously. So I'm not gonna go through all these syndromes, but um, here are a variety of genes that would um, impart you know, at least a, probably a 30% risk of getting colorectal cancer or higher. Um, all of them are dominant conditions, except for this um, mute YH associated polyposis, which is a recessive condition, meaning both copies of the gene need to be inherited and, and mutated to develop this condition. We typically you get one non-working copy from mom and one non-working copy from dad. Then there's more these moderate risk genes, and, and many of these moderate risk genes are actually genes that may be high risk for other cancers. Like many, I'm sure many people have heard of the BRCA1 and 2 genes, which are primarily known for breast and ovarian cancer, but there's a lot of data coming out that shows that these genes may increase the risk of developing colon cancer. Um, people that have one mute YH mutation seem to have a twofold risk of developing colorectal cancer. Um, so again, these are genes where perhaps you'd offer colonoscopies a little bit more frequently. And then you have these newer genes that have been more recently linked to causing colon cancer. And what's a little unique for these uh, newer genes is that all these genes are really presumed to be high risk genes. Um, and many of them cause colorectal cancer as well as polyposis, which is the formations of again, dozens to hundreds, even thousands of polyps. But these are all newer, so we really need to study more families to get a better sense of what the actual risk of developing colon cancer is with these genes. So historically, um, probably about 1995 up until currently, you know, most times when we did genetic testing, we would test for the single condition. So a patient would walk in the door, we'd map out their personal and family history, we would think about what is the most likely cause for the colorectal cancer in their family, and we would test them for that particular situation. And in some cases, we still do that. But in 2013, a new, um, this next generation sequencing became available to us in terms of testing for hereditary cancer syndromes. And so these panel tests became available where you can test for multiple genes all in one test. And many, many times, it was significantly less expensive than testing for single gene conditions. So when you offer somebody a panel, you can test them from just the high risk genes, or you can do just the high and the moderate risk, or you can test for all three categories. So it's a way to get a lot of information back to people who want it. You know, typically when we offer people genetic testing, this is a little bit of a moving target. You know, there are guidelines to exist for when to offer genetic testing to people. So really anybody who's diagnosed with colorectal cancer under the age of 50 should be offered testing. Um, anybody who's had greater than 10 adenomas or 10 precancerous polyps um, should be offered testing. If somebody's had two to three juvenile polyps or Putz Jaeger's polyps, so these are specific terms you would see on a pathology report. Uh, again, anybody who's had more than five, what are called serrated polyps. Anybody who has a colorectal cancer that has evidence of deficient mismatch repair. Or again, when you're seeing multiple family members with colorectal cancer and the combination of other cancers and polyps. Most insurance companies cover some, if not all, the expense of germline genetic testing when it's indicated. And um, again, it's all done through this newer next generation sequencing technology. With the high and the moderate risk genes, you know, these, this information is seen as clinically actionable, and which is why many insurances will cover it because you can offer some combination of increased screening. So doing colonoscopies maybe every one to two years instead of every five to 10 years or in some cases, you may offer somebody a preventative surgery. So for some of the conditions where there's a risk of developing thousands of polyps, we will speak to people about the pros and cons of preventive removing their colon so that they don't get colorectal cancer. And again, with these high and moderate risk genes, you can then potentially clearly identify who in the family is at genetic risk with additional testing so that you can start screening them earlier for colon cancer. With these new or lower risk genes, because we don't know the full level of risk, there's not a lot of evidence to say that we need increased screening, even though these people probably do. 
So we don't really know what to recommend right now for these newer and lower risk genes. We know that we need more data to figure out what is the best screening regimen for them. When germline genetic testing is done, there are three possible results. The results can be positive, which is either reported as a pathogenic or a likely pathogenic variant. This confirms the increased risk for colorectal cancer as well as other polyps or cancers. And then testing can be done for other individuals. Sometimes the results can be negative where no variants are identified. And so it's not likely to be hereditary in these situations, but really no genetic testing is 100% perfect. And when genetic testing is negative, we typically don't recommend uh, testing for other relatives. Um, again, certain situations we do, but not always. And then sometimes the results can be inconclusive, where a variant of uncertain significance is identified. And this is basically a variation in the genetic code in which we don't know whether or not that change actually increases the risk of cancer or not. So for people that are, do genetic testing and are found to have variants of uncertain significance, we typically do not change medical management, and we do not recommend testing for other family members because we just don't know what the results mean. Ideally, when you do germline genetic testing, you want to start with somebody who's had cancer. It's when the testing is most informative. Um, that's not always possible, though, as some people have um, passed from their cancer. So you, you can test people who have not had cancer, um, but when the genetic test results come back negative, they're really not completely informative. We don't know exactly whether somebody's still at high risk or not, because we just don't know, you know, maybe there's a mutation in the family and they did inherit it. Maybe the results are falsely negative because um, something was missed on the test itself, or maybe we didn't include the gene on the test, or we don't know if somebody who hasn't had cancer, when they're negative, they're really a true negative, meaning, yeah, their parent had a hereditary colon cancer, they didn't inherit the risk, but we don't know that because that parent passed and we weren't able to really test them to know that for sure. So ultimately, this slide's basically saying there's a lot of nuance when you're doing genetic testing in people who have not had cancer that requires some interpretation. So what if you were tested? So I would say that if you were genetically tested before 2013, it's worth following up with the healthcare provider that tested you to see if any additional genetic testing is needed or should be considered. If you were tested after 2013, I would check back with your healthcare provider every one to two years to see if additional testing should be considered. Um, our knowledge of genes change, the technology changes where we can pick up additional um, mutations that previously we couldn't detect. So it's always good to stay in contact with your genetics professional or whoever ordered your, your genetic testing to learn about these changes. Um, so the germline genetic testing summary, again, this is testing that's typically done on blood or saliva to help determine the cause of a cancer and to identify a future risk of cancer for that individual and the family. It can be done on anyone, um, and there's certain criteria to determine the best candidates for testing. It can be done on a single gene versus a panel of genes. Again, it's often covered by insurance, but not always. And again, testing may be done a second time in the future when more information is known. So I wanna thank you for your attention. Um, here's my contact information if you have any questions. And I believe we have about 10 minutes or so for questions. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Scott. What a great presentation. Um, wonderful overview. I'm gonna go ahead and take back the controls here for a moment. Okay. Um, let's see, okay, so we did have a number of questions come through. Um, and we'll, let's see, we have about seven minutes or so. So let's, let's get started here. So the first question, um, when I Google Lynch syndrome test, the first thing to pop up is an ad for color genomics, which is a direct to consumer test done via saliva. Can Lynch be diagnosed by this method? So through saliva. Yes, so Lynch syndrome and really any hereditary cancer syndrome can be diagnosed through saliva or blood. Um, with companies that offer direct to consumer testing, there can actually be some limitations in the technology specific for Lynch syndrome. So if you're concerned about Lynch syndrome, the direct-to-consumer option may not always be the best one. 
And I would absolutely follow up with a genetics professional to be evaluated to make sure that you get the right test ordered. Thank you. Um, kind of a question along those same lines. Um, in terms of the multi-gene tests that you discussed earlier, does a genetic counselor offer these tests or does a patient typically get them from someone else on their treatment team and who would review the, those results with them? That's a great question. So if you're talking about a somatic tumor test, typically that's going to be ordered by a medical oncologist, sometimes a colorectal surgeon. Um, if you're talking about a hereditary cancer test or a germline test, typically maybe ordered by a genetic counselor first, but sometimes the medical oncologist or a surgeon may order it depending upon where you are in the country and what you have access to. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, somatic testing for the tumor, uh, tissue biopsy versus liquid biopsy. What's the difference and which is better? Uh, so that's a, that's a really good question. So the a liquid biopsy is basically a term that is used to describe when, they, when the laboratory is looking for cancer cells that are circulating in your blood. And um, they can sometimes detect mutations that way when people have maybe metastatic cancer. Um, in terms of comparing tumor and liquid, um, it really depends on several factors. Sometimes it's physician preference, sometimes it's patient health. Um, and what what is easily accessible. So if somebody has metastatic disease, but it's in a part of the liver that is really difficult to get at with a biopsy, a physician may opt to do a liquid biopsy instead. Um, so there are several factors that go into it. Um, I think more times than not, when you're dealing with solid tumors, so colorectal cancer, breast cancer, you really wanna try and get tissue if you can. And if you can't, then you typically go to the liquid biopsy. And is liquid biopsy considered next generation sequencing? It is. So they do use the same next generation sequencing technology. Um, and depending upon the liquid biopsy company, sometimes you can get hereditary information out of that and sometimes you cannot. Some of the um, liquid biopsy companies will mask the hereditary information. Great, thank you. Let's see. Um, how many types of BRAF mutations are there? Do, uh, do non-BRAF V600E mutations have a better or worse prognosis? Uh, really good question. Uh, there can be other BRAF mutations. Really the most well-studied one is that V600E. And so at this point, um, I don't believe that they are changing treatment recommendations for BRAF mutations other than those. And that's where probably doing that information in a clinical trial may be of, of benefit. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, we have a number that have just come in, so I'm kind of sorting through. Um, some tests have both somatic and germline um, incorporated, those multi-gene tests that you had re referenced earlier. Um, why then are they still offered independently? Is this something due to cost or is it because some patients don't need all of the testing done. Yeah, so that, that's very insightful. Um, and I didn't want to, didn't go this granular in the talk. Um, so there are some differences in the way that somatic laboratories and germline laboratories report out information. Most of the laboratories that do the somatic testing will not tell you that they identified something that's hereditary. So typically what happens is there are genetics providers that are reviewing somatic reports. And there's information that we can get from the laboratories that gives us hints that there's something hereditary. And so what we often have to do in those situations is do a blood test or a saliva test to confirm that something that was identified in the tumor is actually hereditary or not. Um, the somatic companies, they're very complete, they're very thorough tests, they're very accurate. But with respect to hereditary information, it's not always as accurate. And so that's why we still do the second testing um, to help identify those folks that may have it and confirm something that's identified in a somatic test. Additionally, not all patients with colorectal cancer end up having a somatic test. And that is why the germline tests are still available. 
Now, five years from now, it could be a completely different story. It could be kind of an all-in-one, but right now they are separated out for some technical reasons. So kind of along the same line, would anyone ever need to have both the MSI analysis and the IHC test? Um, in rare situations, when you're looking for Lynch syndrome, you may end up having both. I know that I've ordered it in certain, in certain situations. Occasionally, the results are not concordant, meaning you could have the IHC that is normal, but the MSI is abnormal or vice versa. Um, so if you strongly suspect Lynch syndrome based on a family history and the tumor test is telling you you don't have it and you've only done one of them, you may do the other one just to make sure that that it matches. Okay, great. And I, I'm going to ask one final question um, since we are at our time. But if testing was done first on a biopsy in um, 2013 and then it was done again, let's say now, so a few years later, would would the testing be done on the previous biopsy or would a new biopsy be needed? Um, so they would typically want to do a new biopsy. So what can happen in the life of a cancer is that the mutations that are there at the time of diagnosis, if the colorectal cancer comes back, there could be new mutations that have driven the cancer to become metastatic. And so if you're looking for treatment options, you want to see what's going on with the cancer currently versus what was going on four or five years ago, because you can get different information. New mutations can show up, other ones can disappear. Um, so sometimes doctors will do them at different points in time to look at the progression to make sure that if they're gonna try and recommend something off label, that they're really looking at what's kind of currently going on with those cancer cells. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up now. Um, it's been at the hour and thank you so much, Scott. This was a wonderful presentation. And to everyone listening, um, we've had a number of questions come through and yes, the recording of the webinar will be uh, posted to the Fight CRC website. Um, no later than tomorrow. And then if you did register for the webinar, um, you'll be emailed a link um, to view uh, the recording. So thank you, Scott, so much. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.